adaptable. And uh, like uh, so many of our past colleagues, uh, including the late Elliot Sperling, uh, these are colleagues who are very greatly missed in our department. Uh, and of course, that uh, leads me to the introduction for today. And uh, today's uh, lecture is endowed by the late Gene and Dennis Sino. It is the Gene and Sen uh, Dennis Sino Faculty Fellowship Lectures. Uh, they're endowed in the Seuss Department by the late Doreen of our field. Uh, Dennis, in fact, left his house to the university and the proceeds from the sale of the house endowed this lecture. Uh, in non-COVID times, the lecturer actually comes to campus for about a week uh, and not only gives this lecture, but interacts with students and faculty, uh, participates, participates in class sessions, etc. But unfortunately, up for the last few years, it has had to be virtual. There has been an interesting benefit to the virtual lectures, namely that these lectures being on Zoom have reached a worldwide audience. And I think the general consensus is that going forward, even when we move back to the in-person lectures, the, those lectures will be not just on campus, but at the same time available through Zoom. So for you, those of you in the audience, going forward next semester onwards, hopefully we'll be back to having lecturers on campus in person, but there will also be the Zoom facility so these lectures can reach the world. In addition, the lectures are recorded and the department puts them up on our website so you can consult them. So with many thanks to the late Gene and Dennis Sino, we have today's lecture on the Huns of Central Asia. And please, I have the great, great pleasure of virtually introducing Etienne de la Vasser, who is a professor of medieval Central Asian history at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. He is extremely well known, so my introduction can be very brief. We all know of him from his book on Sogdian traders, and we also should all know about him from his book, Samarkand uh, uh, and Samara, the elites of Central Asia during uh, the Abbasid Caliphate. Uh, he is truly a, a, a pioneer, a legend in the field. And in addition to his books, of course, he, like so many of us uh, who work in these areas, has done field work in the area, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, uh, uh, if I remember correct, uh, 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 also I think Tajikistan, if I remember correctly, Atan. Uh, and like so many of us, uh, he has come to realize that these parts of the world, or shall we say our access to these parts of the world tends to be fleeting. At different points of our career, we are able to access them and then we essentially get driven out and hopefully we are able to return. Uh, so uh, in, in some ways, it of course makes our careers interesting. In some ways, a little bit dangerous occasionally. I do remember on the Afpak border always having to travel with armed guards, even in the best of times. Uh, and Etienne probably has had similar experiences in Afghanistan as well. So that having been said, let, uh, let us all welcome, in, uh, welcome him. And uh, uh, we will listen to his lecture. Please hold your questions until the end. At that point, raise your hand, we will come to you. Or if you want to put a question in chat, April will moderate them and send them on to me. But it has to be a question. If you have a monologue, a, uh, you know, a dialogue, a comment, whatever, I will just ensure that April cuts you off. Brief question, because the star of the day is our speaker. And with thanks again to the late Jean and Dennis Sino, it is my great pleasure to welcome our speaker uh, uh, to present to us. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jamshid. Uh, thanks a lot for, for your kind words and for inviting me uh, in Bloomington. 
thanks a lot to, to Apfried Younger uh, for organizing everything. Uh, I should, I think I will try to share my screen. Okay. Do you, can you see it? It's okay. Uh, I should apologize first to have exchanged Bloomington for this Zoom uh, meeting. Uh, 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 when I decided the war in Ukraine was starting and the COVID was still very high, so that I became afraid that something might go wrong and decided to play the safe card of a distant lecture. I apologize especially to the students, uh, but please note that I can easily be contacted by email or Zoom or whatever uh, and will be happy to provide advices. I have chosen this topic in remembrance of Denis Sainer. I am obviously very much honored to have been invited as a, as a gene on Denis Sainer's lecturer. I have actually met once Professor Sainer. I was very young writing my dissertation on the Soldier Traders. And then he had been invited in Paris at a conference on historical nomads. I had the possibility to discuss with him on the then freshly discovered Sobyan graffiti on the upper Indus. He was especially interested by the quite frequent name of Hun among the caravanese who engraved their names on the bank of a river waiting for crossing it. The Hun or Huns had always been one of his favorite topics. I will try to present today what we know of the Huns during the fourth and fifth centuries, not in Europe, but while they crossed unsettled in Central Asia, with two parts. The first one on the current and very hot debates going on on the migration or not of the ends through Central Asia, with very interesting recent theoretical developments on the notions of identities or archeological markers. And then in the second part, I will deal with the settlement of the ends in Central Asia itself. I will try both to be synthetic, but also to present some very recent developments of research, some of my own, which are obviously provisional and may be wrong. So let's begin. Okay. Uh, one moment. Uh, So uh, let's begin by situating the, the debates on the migration of the Huns politically. This topic of the migration of the Huns and the link with the Xiongnu of antiquity, uh, north of China, was not only, not only a favorite topic of Sino, it is also a very old topic. As early as the 18th century, Joseph de Guine wrote his Histoire générale des Huns, des Turcs, des Mogols et des autres Tartares occidentaux, published in Paris in 1756, where he proposed a continuous history linking the Xiongnu from northern China to the Attilanic or European Huns. His argument was not at all ethnic or linguistic, but behavioral. The Huns and the Xiongnu shared a common way of life. However, this argument was transformed at the end of the 19th century into a racial one. The question of the hands was integrated into a wider problem that of the Greek migration period, the Fulker van der Roo. Nomadic groups were seen and described by these historians as closed entities with a racial and linguistic identity, migrating in compact groups on the steppe. In a parallel way, in archaeology, a group was, was supposed to be identified with an archaeological culture, according to, to uh, the late 19th century research of Gustave Cosina, who identified artifact distributions, used the, this distribution to create archaeological cultures, equated, equated the resulting culture with peoples, and then invoked migration as a means by which these people change culture. Cosina's migration model was provided by the movements of the barbarian during the Volker van der Roon period. The culmination of this historiography 
during the first half of the last century with its nationalistic and racist uh, ideological background is quite perfectly illustrated by the renaming of uh, Ukraine, the poor Ukrainian towns and ports by the Nazi, with names extracted from the migration narrative of the history of the Goth, erasing the actual past in name of a fantasmatic one, and we can see it now again. Hitler wanted that Ukraine was to be renamed Gothenland. Simferopol was supposed to be Gothenburg, and Sebastopol was Theo Theoderic's asset. After the Second World War, obviously such attempts to identify migrating peoples during the Volker van der Rohe period fell into disuse. Notions like identity or migration were deconstructed and archeology span itself gave priority to internal explanation of cultural, cultural change uh, in contrast to the external impacts of migrations and conquests. Up to the point of denying the very possibility of proving migration with a scientifically sound archeological methodology. These debates for obvious political reasons were mainly on Germanic migrations, peoples and identities. As David Anthony puts it, migrations, archeological cultures and the Aryans were the three deadly sins of steppe archeology. span However, the prime mover uh, of, uh, of this period of Volker van der Rohe, the group which set into motion the other ones, uh, the arrival of the Huns in Europe, crossing the Volga shortly after 370, was left largely outside of these debates, except in Hungary. It received a separated treatment just after the war. Otto mentioned Elfen, uh, the sinologist from Berkeley, with a deep knowledge both of Chinese sources and Russian speaking archaeology, dismissed the very possibility raised by the Dean of a link between the Xiongnu and the Huns. Especially, he dismissed the testimony, a letter written uh, uh, in Sogyan and sent from Chinese Gansu to Samarkand. Here you have uh, the wrapping, uh, uh, and here you have the text a letter dating from the early fourth century and discovered by O.L. Stein in a ruined Chinese tower close to Dunhuang, in which this trader, Nana Yvande, was naming uh, here on, in some of the, some of the parts, uh, Hun the Xiongnu, Pieging, the main towns of Northern China. After the article by Manchin Elfen, the situation was frozen during half a century. While in Western historiography, the debates was raging, the debate was raging between historians and archaeologists, the Huns were left outside of it. I was totally ignorant, please believe me, I was totally ignorant of all these very dark and complex historiographical past and very naive when I wrote my 2005 article on the Huns and Xiongnu for the Central Asiatic Journal. I had read only uh, mentions Elfen articles, and I was only sure of one point, but it was wrong as regards the Sogdian letter. I will, I will summarize the, uh, quickly the argument here. Indeed, this uh, Sogdian testimony is central. Mention Elfen tried to compare this letter to various manuscripts giving in the Greco-Roman tradition the name of the Huns, more often than not by pure chance because of mistakes of the scribe or distant hearsay of the name of the hand. At least uh, during this period, the beginning of the fourth century, uh, the context in China was the following. There was a general rebellion of the numerous Tin dynasty princes fighting one against the other. In this context of Kublin's uh, Tin state, Liu Yuan, the head of the Liu dynasty, was an important member, was first an important member of the Qin court, where he was sent as an hostage from the uh, southern Xiongnu territory in Shanxi. He was a southern Xiongnu, named so in the Chinese sources, and he was offered the ancestral Xiongnu title of Shanyu by the conspiracy of Xiongnu nobles in 304 uh, during the civil war of the princes. The Soviet letter of 313 does 
describe the Liu offensives against the Qin armies. It was Xiongnu troops that took Luoyang, Chang'an, and were close to Ye. The Liu, by far and large, the biggest players in the field up to uh, 319, titled Shan Yu and direct descendants of a whole line of Shan Yu of the south of Xiongnu, at the head of the five hordes of the Xiongnu, were undoubtedly Xiongnu in the full meaning of the name. That is a political and historical one. The capture of Qin Emperor was transported to the Liu court in 311. Here is a translation of a relevant part of a letter. It is exactly what the Sogdian trader wrote. Answers the last emperor, so they say, fled from Luoyang because of a famine and fire was set to his palace and to the city, and the palace was burnt and the city destroyed. Luoyang is no more, Ye is no more. Moreover, when the some part are destroyed by the Huns and by them, Chang'an, if indeed they held, so far as the town, we don't know where it is, and as far as Ye, these same Huns who yesterday were the emperor's subjects. Answers, we do not know whether the remaining Chinese were able to expel the Huns from Chang'an from China or whether they took the country beyond. This is a translation of Nicolas Simpson's. There is a very precise match between the report of the Sogdian traders and the events as described in the, by the Chinese sources. So that obviously it was not accurate to deal with the Sogdian testimony in the way mention, mention Elfen has done. Our trader was a direct witness, not a monk in a remote scriptorium making blunder. He was plainly giving a report to a colleague on the political situation in Northern China. He was extremely well aware of what was going on and his first hand testimony could not be dismissed. Moreover, I dis discovered in two Buddhist translation of the Lalita Vista and the Tathagata Guya Sutra by a Bactrian monk in Dunhuang, precisely at the same, during the same period, the end of the third century, the beginning of the fourth century, that this monk, Dharmaraksha, Dharma translated Huna in a Sanskrit text by Xiongnu. Here uh, you have the Tathagata Guya Sutra, you have, we have the Tibetan uh, version, the Sanskrit is lost, but the Tibetan version is very uh, faithful. And you can see uh, the name of uh, various, uh, uh, it's, it is a list of countries uh, as seen from uh, a Northern Indian point of view at the beginning of the, at the turn of the era, something like the first century AD, something like that. Uh, 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 we have first the Indos in this list, uh, we have first the in, in, in Indo-Scythian uh, from Zeista, the Saka, uh, then the Parthian, the Palava, the Anzi in Chinese. Uh, you have uh, 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 the Bactrian, uh, Togar, or uh, Uege. Uh, you have uh, uh, the Hellenistic world, Dachin, or uh, Yamana. Yamana. Then you have uh, Cambodia, the Himalaya, the Rasa, which is supposed to be a mountainous country in the uh, Himalaya, and then the Huna, and then the Chinese, and then the Dardic people. And all these uh, names are translated into Chinese, or sometimes they are, uh, they are uh, expanded. For instance, for the Rasa, which is uh, the people of the Himalaya, uh, the, 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 the Chinese translator will explain that it is all the people which are north of China, or north of India, sorry. So it is uh, Turfan, and Shan Shan, and Kashgar, and Kotan, and Kucha, and so on. And the same, the Chinese translator, so this Bactrian monk will do the same with uh, uh, Huna in the Sanskrit text, and will say that it is the Xiongnu and the Xianpei. Uh, uh, so he updates the name Huna by saying that uh, uh, this is two, uh, Chinese, there are two Chinese names explaining the Huna. Uh, uh, in, and indeed, at the end of the third century, the Xianpei occupied exactly the place that the Xiongnu occupied at the time of the writing of the origin text. Uh, uh, so that for contemporaries, the Bactrian monk and the Sogdian trader writing in Dunrong and in Gansu, uh, 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 Xiongnu was only the Chinese name of the Huns. 
this part of my argument has been uh, basically accepted. It is very clear that mentioned uh, Elfen uh, as, uh, uh, was wrong. But Christopher Hatwood, it was, he was invited by, uh, by, uh, for this, this lecture a few years ago, has published an article in which if he accepts the global idea that Hearn in Sogan are the Sung of the Chinese, he disputes the path of borrowing. And I would like to comment because it is a recent article and uh, I've never answered to this article. For him, the Sanskrit form of the name, Runa, uh, is closer to the disyllabic original, uh, which should have, be, uh, and it should have circulated or by Citrade or by the Citroen Road before circulating by caravan roads in Inner Asia. The Sogans would have adopted the name Run from the Indic language. However, I do not agree. And it is quite simple to answer to this idea. Because of its riff, rhythmic law, Sogyan would have shortened the disyllabic runa uh, to run. And while uh, and Sanskrit would have or borrowed directly the name of the run uh, in the Xinjiang Oasis, especially in Khotan, or expanded the Sogyan monosyllabic run to runa, which is normal in Sanskrit. There is no need for a roundabout of thousands of kilometers by sea or such one, while the Sogyan were in direct contact with the Sunglu in the north and the east, as we know from the Shuti. So uh, 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 Rune is the direct name of the, of the, of the Sunglu in Sogyan. Uh, I also uh, pointed out in this article that in northern Mongolia, uh, uh, close to the Altai, the Chinese sources were still describing, at the beginning of the fifth century, very powerful remnants of the Xiong. It is important because one of the common arguments against the link between the Xiong and the Hans is that the empire of the Xiong having crumbled in the second century AD, they could not be linked uh, with, with the Huns two centuries later. But with this new text, northwest of the Zhujan in central Mongolia, there are remnants of the Sumu, a very powerful and rich people or kingdom. With this new text, this counter-agreement was demonstrated false. Moreover, the Chinese sources were also describing nomadic groups migrating, migrating from the Altai in the middle of the fourth century towards Central Asia. This is a, a, a passage, an extract from the Tongyan. The Tongyan is quite late, it's 800 AD, but it, it's quoting from lost sources and it, as far as we can see, is very faithful. And he wrote that the Ephthalites, the Yada, uh, came from the north of the Chinese frontier and went to the south from the Altai. They are to the west of Kotan and to the reign of Wencheng of a later way, that is the middle of the uh, fifth century, 80 or 90 years have passed. So it would mean that the Ephthalites migrated from the Altai towards Central Asia, they will settle in Afghanistan, uh, uh, in about 360. Uh, this part of my argument, the textual part, has not been refuted. The Sogan traders and Bactrian monks were naming Xiongnu Huns and vice versa at the beginning of the fourth century. There were Xiongnu in Mongolia in the fourth century. The Chinese texts are describing a migration from the Altai in the middle of the fourth century. And finally, the Huns arrived from the east on the Volga in 370. That much is certain. However, in a very recent article published in, in 2018, Walter Paul, one of the main and most learned voices, on the question of identities of peoples during the Volker von der Rung period, has concluded from all this data that uh, uh, what I was demonstrating was not a cultural continuity between the Xiongnu of antiquity and the European ends, but an identity in name only. He accepts the idea of migration, but as a few elite Xiongnu families who might have triggered the migration of a conglomerate of groups and might have traveled all the way to Europe through Central Asia, providing a name, but not much else, actually. This raises the question of identities of political groups for which there, have been, uh, there has been a tremendous amount of work 
uh, during sort of a migration period, especially uh, as regards the migration in uh, in uh, in Europe and what they are called, is one of the main uh, voice, um, one of the main voices in this debate. And I think I, that I can contribute to this debate, uh, which is on too often understood with only the Western history of ideas in mind. Uh, indeed, in Europe, this historian is totally dependent from the sources, the, Greco, the, the Greek or Roman sources. And, uh, uh, and they are too prone maybe to see everything through the filter of Greek or, or Roman historiography. Excellent author, like for instance, Florin Kurta, who is writing, writing tremendous books and articles on the archaeology of Eastern Europe during this period, uh, is, uh, is, 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 is quite certain that uh, uh, all the narrative of migration arriving from very far away in the East uh, by people deplacing one another, nomadic people uh, chasing one another, is just uh, a, a, a reminiscence of Herodotus and uh, the narrative of uh, Herodotus on the Scythians. Uh, uh, it is sure that the, at the meeting point between nomadic group identity and migration is the question of group coherence in such context. For a long time, these migration, especially in the 19th century, have been described uh, uh, in an overly simple manner. Homogen homogeneous nomadic groups would chase each other and end up in the west like billiard balls on the green, green uh, table of a, of a step. Uh, and this image was born from the reading of Western description that could only, or so they say, uh, reflect internal presupposition of Greek ways of thinking. Uh, it would be uh, Herodotus at, at the root of all these images that we can see also in uh, Byzantine sources, in medieval sources, and so on. It would be only a Greek way of seeing the history of, of the state. However, uh, if this presentation of events in the state is found among Greek historians, from Herodotus to the Byzantines, it is found identically among the Chinese and the Persians who owe nothing to the Greek uh, conceptions. Uh, this is how the events of the first century BC, for instance, are evoked. We show the Sumu chasing the Uija, winter chase the Saka, or the migration of the Ogus on the Pechenegg in the 10th century. This conception of chain migrations originated from the nomadic groups themselves, who presented their history in this way, the history of a state by the state, it is a nemic concept, which Western and Eastern historiographies they transcribe in identical terms uh, in Chinese or in Greek. For our period, we have series of successive texts describing the movements of groups arising in the steppe north of the Black Sea from Central Asia as a result of a whole chain of modifications of the grazing areas. There, these descriptions are most probably drawn from steppe narratives which are only partly reformated on the Herodotian model. And the end migration is part of this, uh, of this narrative. This, this does not mean that the moving entity is identical at the starting point and at the end. It is necessary to retain from this notion, transmitted schematically by historians, the idea of trajectories on percussions but between political entities that are neither fixed nor entirely fluid, but evolve, but can strengthen or disintegrate. Chinese source, closer to the events, know that there are still, there are still some small Uedja behind, left behind the Uedja, or remnants of the Xiongnu after the departure of the Han. Above all, in Turkish and Uyghur later texts produced by the nomadic societies themselves, a complex system of conquest, partial as absorption, various fates made to competing elites, embedding of their identities, or on the, of the contrary, absorb, absorption under, under the new dominant group, but also of fleeing to the West, emerges. 
with this conception, I've never published that, but, but it's, an, I think, a quite important point because uh, if you are reading the Western historiography, everything is Greek. No, no, the, the, the nomads were describing their political history in this way. With this conception in mind, we have to turn toward the second component of the argument, the archaeological one. In the same volume in which uh, uh, Paul uh, discusses the identities of her urns in light of my textual data, Ursula Broseder, a major specialist of the funerary archaeology in Mongolia, discussed the archaeological side of my argument. She refuted two of my hypotheses, one on the climate, uh, on, because in one of my articles, I considered the possibility that the migration from the Altai might have been triggered by climatic changes in Inner Asia. And I know that Nicola Di Cosmo has, has presented these works on the role of cli uh, climate uh, <coughs> in Inner Asian uh, history. Uh, actually, an article of paleoclimatology uh, was saying precisely that, and uh, as I do not have any competence in the, on these topics, I slavishly followed it. But since then, this this article has been refuted on a hard scientific ground, so that she's certainly right in pointing out that this part of my argument cannot be maintained. I was wrong. The second hypothesis, however, is much more central to my argument. Uh, the shape of the unique cauldrons in Eastern Europe, one of the few artifacts that we are sure are unique due to their spatial a uh, special uh, uh, distribution. I've seen nowhere uh, an attempt to doubt that they are that they are unique. Actually, everybody is regarding them uh, as unique. You have a map here. Uh, um, uh, is the, so these uh, the, these unique cauldrons are very close to the cauldrons discovered in Inner Asia. Uh, sorry, this one. Uh, to the, to the left, you have cauldrons discovered in Hungary. And to the right in color, you have a, a, a unique cauldron discovered close to Urumuchi in Xinjiang. Uh, these Eastern cauldrons uh, uh, are very characteristic with their square handles with three or four mushrooms on top of them on lateral mushrooms. The body of the cauldrons is bell-shaped and often divide, divided in sections. They are not very high. The, their weight is about 16 to 20 kilograms, and the height is generally uh, 50 to 60 centimeters. The biggest is uh, 89 centimeters high. Moreover, many cauldrons in Eastern Europe were discovered buried on the banks of rivers, not in tombs. And such also was the case in the Minusins Basin, north of the Altai, and in various spots in between. So that I suggested in this article that there was a ritual continuity between Inner Asia and, in, and Hungary. In other words, I was saying that there was an archaeological marker of the migration of the herd. The topic of the archaeological markers of identities has been extensively dealt with in the West. Dozens of academics are currently debate, debating it. Some of them are still accepting that carefully selected artifacts in the tombs can indeed point toward a self-defined identity, while many others would deny any possibility of subsuming a tomb inventory under a unique political or ethnic identity. But with one single object, I was certainly far away from the consensus of a professional archaeologist going almost all the way back to Cosina on the 19th century and the cultures. Uh, as Ursula Broseder wrote, I quote, the flow of using cauldrons as evidence lies in the notion that a single archaeological object or one or more elements of it may be regarded as a marker of a group and thus indicative of a migration. From an archaeological methodological point of view, this is not valid. This is a very powerful objection by somebody extremely highly regarded as an archaeologist. So let's be uh, more precise on this quarter. It is certainly true that precious and fashionable goods can circulate without any migration taking place. 
elite taste can be unified on very large regions, on precious signs that the owner of a tomb is belonging to the elite did circulate. For instance, the cloisonné style of gold ornamented uh, go of gold ornamented with enclosed garnets is in this period a characteristic of the various powers of a state and of their neighbors. Uh, on my title image, uh, you, you have seen a funerary mass of a Yueban hand from the fifth century Ili Valley north of the Tianshan in Cloisonne style. And indeed, some researchers had made the mistake of making use of distribution. Uh, or creating a distribution maps to such uh, of such pre precious goods to identify the ends. Here you have uh, such a, such a map of this the splendid di diadem with a cloisonne in cloisonne style. Um, but these precious and you have them in the east, but also in the uh, in the west, sorry, but also in the east in the order, for instance. Uh, but these precious diadems can be borrowed, traded, given, imitated. They are useless to demonstrate why the ants migrated from the east to the west. And I agree with Ursula Brosseter that, I quote, these findings illustrate best the mobility of goods and connectivity of an elite, as opposed to migration between Europe and Asia of the late fourth and fifth century. But is it the case with the cauldron? These artifacts are extremely common in the state. You have them for all the periods with various shapes and sizes. The honey cauldrons are of an extremely bad quality of workmanship in almost pure copper with many impurities. They were used on a frequent basis as they were patched and repaired. They certainly do not belong to the category of elite groups which would, uh, of, of edit goods, sorry, which would be valuable enough to be exchanged on a long distance basis. basis. They're not very big, I mean, uh, 60, kilo, uh, 60, 60 uh, centimeters in, in copper, repaired patch, so these are not very uh, good looking uh, artifacts. Uh, obviously, they are not the most daily artifacts, there are ceramic problems but their bad quality precludes to analyze their, their distribution in terms of edit fashion. They are certainly not representative of the summit of the arc. Moreover, they are very specific. Uh, the mushrooms on the end are not at all known in other cultures of the Western state. There are many colons, Osaka colons, Amatian colons, but nowhere you have these mushrooms. Uh, uh, the only other place on the earth where you, we can see these handles are in the east. Uh, uh, and uh, one more, we, are, uh, we have this called one, one, once more, we have, we, we have this called one from Urumuchi on the right side, which is exactly the same uh, as the, the, the uh, Hungarian one, and that Ursula Bostider has to interpret as a re importation from the west to the east, uh, perfectly ad hoc hypothesis. But there is more. On the question of the handles, clearly there is a typology, as demonstrated by our colleague, the prof Professor Ayashi. You can see the evolution uh, uh, from uh, in Mongolia uh, on the altar in antiquity of these small birds growing with time up to the fully developed mushroom of the uh, European colon. Sorry, I mixed up the, yeah, so we, uh, we go, okay. Uh, <laughs> Here are uh, the, the slide I wanted to, to, to show. Uh, you have uh, the first step in China and Mongolia, uh, 100 BC to 150 AD. And you can see the small birds on the, si uh, on the side of, 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 the, of the other handles. They are very small, just like, uh, triangular uh, on that sole in this world. But in Mongolia and the Altai later, you have uh, it's not exactly the big mushrooms that we have uh, in Hungary or in Urumqi, but we can see that the creation of, uh, of this mushroom, the evolution between this and this, uh, and, and, and the, uh, the mushrooms in the uh, unique colon are, are, are the results of this uh, evolution. Uh, there is nothing, I should point also that there is nothing functional in these mushrooms. 
but it is only a decorative element or a symbolic one, but we don't know what is the meaning. What is more, I'm going back, uh, these mushrooms are very commonly represented in petroglyphs on the sites of Sulek, Malaya, and Bolshaya, Boyarskaya, Pisanitsa in the Minusins Basin, north of Yaltai, traditionally dated to the Tagar culture of antiquity. You can see the cliff, the engraving, and the villages, and you can see a lot of, of cauldrons among uh, the tents and, or huts of these uh, villages. This was a very common artifact. And if you close uh, in, you can see that, <coughs> that many of these cauldrons are shaped and handles very similar to the Hungarian ones with, uh, with mushrooms on the top of them, uh, here, here. But usually the under or here, you can see very precisely uh, on the top, uh, uh, usually uh, these, uh, uh, these handles are, are round, are not square. That's the main difference. But the only place in the earth when you have handles with mushrooms like this is in the Minocene's basin, on one side, on the other side, it's in uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, I will give a last example of, uh, which is not published on the which uh, I owe to my colleague, uh, Henri Paul Francfort. Uh, it's a very interesting case in which motifs are pre uh, represented both in edit goods like this, it was on a splendid, it was on a work, uh, work uh, and in petroglyph. Uh, you can see these uh, very specific uh, heads of horses, uh, which are from Merovingian tombs and which are known in Eastern Europe also. Uh, uh, and here you have a petroglyph also from the Minusins Basin. And you can see that it is exactly the same way of depicting uh, uh, the head, the heads uh, of the horses. You have a look. Exactly, the parallel is direct. So that at one point, we should ask ourselves, what chance do we have that several motifs attested in unique, in unique Europe are precisely attested on, in one place only on the earth in the Minusin species? While uh, precisely at the same time, the Chinese texts are describing a Sumnu presence in this region on the migration from the, the west from there, while contemporaries are naming the Xiong Nu Hans. I think that the methodological taboo should give way to the fact that archaeological markers might not be used in isolation uh, for identifying, identifying cultures close one to another, but it might be entirely different when these artifacts are linking cultures separated by thousands of kilometers without any commercial or fash fashionable explanation for the transfer. An interesting result is not only that it proves the migration of the Huns from this region in the fourth century, but also that it might lead our European colleagues working on the small places of Europe uh, with a few hundred kilometers to maybe adapt their own theoretical concept of archeological marker to make room to the idea that very distant non-edit object might wait more in the determination of the identity of the archaeological assemblage than other artifacts from close neighbors. You might see that there's something missing in my methodology. I'm not dealing with all the new DNA studies, but we have a problem with hands. We do not have stones, but we have a memorial, so we cannot use DNA. So I regard the migration of the Huns as a conglomerate of various groups surrounding the Altai, proclaiming themselves and regarded by their neighbors as a legitimate heirs to the Sumo Maroon state. Their name did have a powerful meaning, as important as the name of a Roman might have been for the late Byzantine emperor, or even German emperors of the Holy Roman uh, Germanic Empire up to the 18th century. The state nomads have all the right to have their own political history and to make use of this political history to manipulate or claim power. Uh, I will stop here as regards migration to quickly present the state of the art as regards the funds once arrived in Central Asia. I'm sorry, I, I still have five minutes or 10 minutes. Uh, 
in Central Asia, it is necessary to describe the political situation at the beginning of our period. The Sassanid Empire of Iran it was still separated from Central Asia by a buffer state created during the last third of the second century after the conquest of the Kushan Empire, the Kushano Sasanian Kingdom, entrusted by the kings of Iran to a lateral branch of their family, and quite autonomous at the beginning of the fourth century. It is to the north of the Amudaria that two scenarios can be proposed. The first is based on the convergence of archaeological series with texts, which would allow us to speak around the middle of the fourth century of a founding event, a major or relatively rapid migratory episode from the steppe, the migration of the Huns, in one or two generations. This new nomadic power over large parts of Central Asia, and in particular over its cultivated lands, would be parallel to the European events, the so-called Great Invasion. It would be one and the same global movement of the nomadic world over a period of a few decades, the origin of which would be in the Altai. Uh, this would be, in this hypothesis, there would be, in this hypothesis, a unicity of time, the two great directions of the migration towards Central Asia and towards Europe are both situated in a period of about 30 years from about 330. In the, the 50s of the fourth century, Shapur II uh, has to find on its northeastern border against some hostile people, uh, uh, the Kyonids. And uh, he, then he lied uh, with the Kyonids, and then he fought again against the Kyonids. And the Armenian historian, Fosters of Byzantine, said that Shapur has to fought on the eastern front in, the, uh, in 368 and was severely, severely beaten several times by the, the king of the Kushan reigning over the backdrop. There are data also in the Chinese sources. Former nomads from the steppe had to move south, as the Wusun, for instance, you have them on the map, uh, did from the northern side of the Tianjin to the Pamis, according uh, uh, in these Chinese sources, in this very period. So then we would, the first hypothesis would be a compact chronology given by the text, which would be supported by the simultaneous appearance in the archaeological layers of the cities of Central Asia of ceramics up to now characteristic of, re of regions further north, nomadic molded ceramics, Sirdaya ceramics, which are found everywhere in Koreas, which is then truly ravaged, and, and where even the knowledge linked to irrigation seems to have collapsed, in Sogdiana, in Chach, in Bukhara. Many features of the culture of the Sirdaya Delta reach Koreas, reformed skulls, ceramics, modes of burials, and these ceramics reach south, up to southern China. The South of the Sogdiana. And last but not least, my colleague Sean Stag will soon publish an article on the fascinating cemetery of this period with parallels in Asia only with parallels in Asia only in the region situated northwest of Yalta. We will, we will have to wait for it. Until recently, this was a dominant model with deep roots in Soviet historiography. I have followed it uh, in my southern trade. But not all archaeological series support this hypothesis. And the second scenario is emergent. Thus, it seems that in the Bukhara oasis, where they are better dated, it is at least from the second century that nomadic and northern ceramics spread. If we, we were to generalize, generalize the case, but the Bukhara oasis much less urbanized than the others on late, uh, later drain could have been a specific case, a wintering area for nomads, it would be necessary to disconnect these ceramics from the north, from the text describing the nomadic invaders in uh, the middle of the fourth century. Uh, my carbon, uh, my carbon uh, 14 dating of the fortification of, a, of Bactra by a wall surrounding the wall oasis, we are to the north of Bactra here, uh, at the, uh, from the end uh, of the second, uh, sorry, from, from the end of the third to the beginning of the fourth uh, century uh, uh, AD may reinforce uh, this hypothesis. We have made some excavation on all these points and uh, taken some C14 samples. Uh, uh, there would be, there would have been a danger very early, end of the third, beginning of the fourth, coming from the north. 
And here you can see that I am not alone, uh, only an armchair historian. Uh, so that we will be faced with a second very different scenario. The long decline and dislocation of the Kangku, the name of a state which was controlling north of the Amudaria during the second century, following a double movement from the north with nomadic infiltration or on from the south with possibly, possibly the conquest of the Bukhara Oasis at the beginning of the fourth century by the Kushano Sasanian uh, in the wake of their control of the Mev and then, uh, then maybe briefly by Shapur II. In this much broader chronological framework, the wars of the mid fourth century, which cannot be doubted because of the convergence of Byzantine and Chinese texts on them, would only be the final episode of a long lasting decline of Kang uh, Right now, it is impossible to choose between these two scenarios and all the variants in between. We need more archeological data and especially more supporting data. The conquest of Central Asia was a complete one and the period of unique power was a major shift. It can be said that the social landscape creating during this period, in the fourth or fifth century, dominated for half a millennium the societies and organization of power in Sogdiana, Bactriana, or Korea. In the wall of Central Asia, central power collapsed. The territory was divided into hundreds of small castles with their irrigated agricultural lands. In Khorezm, for instance, according to the coinage, there was no longer a unique king, but a prince king with several other princes. The same in, uh, in the Zarafshan Valley. In this fifth century seal from Samarkand, the lord of the city is named in this order, Lord King of the Huns Olarg, Great Kushan King, Prince of Samarkand. And the iconography is modeled on the Iranian one. The Huns by marrying into the local aristocracy or by destroying it, destroying it became a landed gentry. We do meet some uh, of their names among the landed aristocracy in Bactria, for instance, uh, where one name of a king of Huns in the middle of the fourth century, Grumbates, is known for a gentleman of the fifth century, Gorombado, in the Rob documents edited by Nicolas Simsuyan. It seems that from a linguistic point of view, these hunts were very diverse, some of them with Iranian name as Grumbates, protected by the Fragna, some with Turkish name as these Oglar hunts. Politically, uh, Grumbates are no direct successors, and no unified kingdom of the hunts is known. It is only with the 420s that a strong power emerged under Kidara in Bactria, and then after uh, 484 with the Eftala. And this seed is a Kidarite seed. I will stop here uh, uh, because uh, I think uh, I should stop. Uh, I'm sorry for this very dense uh, lecture. Uh, I wanted to present the data in all the debatable depth, uh, my old discoveries and the recent articles criticizing them on my answers on some new results. Uh, I hope that it was interesting. <laughs> and thanks a lot for your attention and your questions. And thanks again for inviting me. Thank you very much. And April, can we now move back to the uh, tile screen so we can see participants? And may I request that uh, those with questions use the raised hand function? I think we already have one question from uh, one of our recent PhD graduates, Julian. Uh, Julian's question is, what is your opinion of the ethnic affiliation of the uh, Sian Nu? What do you think about theories which argue for Turkic, Iranian, uh, et cetera, connections? I, I'm sorry, but it was blurred. Uh, I, could, I could not hear the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, are you able to see the uh, the chat, Etienne? Uh, the chat, uh, where is the... Uh... Down at the bottom, you should see chat. Uh, ah, uh, what is uh, your opinion about the ethnic affiliation of Assyung? What do you think about the... Uh, uh, thank you. I'm not a linguist, so uh, uh, not at all. So I cannot, I cannot answer. Uh, as regards... Uh, as far as I can see, uh, the Yenisian or Paleo-Siberian uh, 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 hypothesis is a, 
uh, has much more to command itself than the, uh, than the other one, the Iranian one. Uh, has been uh, totally abandoned. Uh, and uh, as you get the Turkish one, uh, the, uh, there have been some recent articles trying to still to, to push in that direction. Uh, but uh, I will not, uh, I cannot deal with, really with this side of the top of a question because I'm not a linguist. Thank you. Okay, any uh, on more subsequent... of a, if I, if I may add, uh, the, the idea that there's an ethnicity of a Sungnu is, uh, is misleading, according to me, uh, because you can have a, a, a political identity, a language, a religion, or whatever, uh, of groups uh, surrounded by a wall uh, array of different groups with different affiliation, linguistic one, and so on. Uh, 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 these were political construction. Uh, uh, what we, we used to call tribes, you might have seen, I have never used the name tribe in my lecture, uh, but uh, I am firmly, firmly convinced by, by, that by cons regarding them as, as political groups with political tradition, with political history, with political elites, we are much closer to uh, what they actually did and, 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 and present themselves than the idea of kin-based uh, kin tribes uh, of the old, the old model of uh, nomadic life. So there is no ethnicity of a student. Thank you. Uh, other questions, please. Chris? You are, yeah. I'm, yes, I need to unmute. Um, yes, well, welcome, um, Etienne, to, to Bloomington virtually. Thank you for your lecture. Uh, covered lots of interesting topics. One thing that I, I was curious about, and I didn't hear you, you cover it, but um, it was kind of hard to, for me to hear on this computer that I'm using right now. So um, it's about uh, the, the so-called white Huns. They're described in Procopius, um, who I've always been curious about. And people wonder, well, are they really Huns? Or who were they? Or do you have an idea about this or how they fit in? OK. Uh, as we get the Eftalites, uh, their name white Huns uh, in Procopius. And uh, Procopius is adding a very interesting comment. He's saying that. There are names, in fact, on the name, not only in name, but also in fact. Uh, although they, they live in very different, uh, very, uh, very different from the ends in, 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 uh, in the uh, Pontic uh, step. Uh, with this text, and with the, the, the text from the Tongian saying that the Ephthalites were going south from the Altai in the middle of the, of the fourth century. I'm quite sure that, that, that basically uh, uh, Procopius was, was right. Actually, there were Huns. Uh, the same for the Kidarite. Nobody, we have, we do, do not have a single source saying that the Kidarite are Huns. But now we have a seal saying that they are uh, Oglar Huns. And it is a Kidarite seal, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so so um, at one point, the meaning of the word Hun will, uh, be enlarged, uh, and what is difficult is to, to know precisely when. We know that in later sources, Huns will be used for everything. For instance, in Sogdian text of the eighth century, Huns mean Turks. Uh, uh, similarly, in Cotanese text, Huns mean Uyghur. Uh, uh, so, but I think that the fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth century, the meaning of and is still uh, an attempt to relate to this glorious past of the Sungnu Empire. Uh, I, in a way, my whole uh, scientific position is, is that the step has all the right to have a, 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 a political history and to be proud of it. And uh, 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 they, they admin to transmit this 
a long generation, uh, this uh, political history. And I think, for instance, that the idea and the model provided by David Sniff, uh, uh, the headless state, in which he, 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 he defined, he tried to define, to explain the political history uh, of a state by the existence of aristocracy. Uh, 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 and uh, noble families uh, controlling the, uh, the, 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 the Karabodun, uh, the black people, uh, uh, and with no uh, familial uh, link uh, with them is a very good model to explain how these tradition, these imperial and uh, state tradition could be transmitting along several generations while there is no empire on central power in the steppe. How you can understand that the Turks are clearly copying some, uh, uh, some customs and some uh, organization from the Sunu. And similarly, how you can explain that the Mongol are uh, copying some uh, some 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 Turkish or some new uh, characteristic. It is because these traditions were transmitted uh, into uh, these uh, these families, even when there was no uh, political uni unity uh, in the step. I didn't quite catch you. Who it was you said who had this theory about the aristocratic? Uh... David Sniff Sniff Sniff. Sniff. It is the anthropologist from Oxford. Uh, a, a Mongolist. Sneeze. It's very interesting. It's a very, very good book. Mm. Okay. Thank you. There is uh, another question in the chat, Jan, from Henry Misa. Okay. <laughs> as you uh, you can understand, after my my, my mistake, uh, as you got uh, the mid uh, uh, the the mid fourth century cold phase in the Altai, uh, due to climatic change uh, in the Altai and the uh, which might have triggered the departure of the Huns, it was a mistake. Clearly, uh, uh, I will be very cautious now <laughs> to to. Uh, 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 I would be very cautious to, 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 to make use of climate, uh, uh, direct use uh, 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 of, of climate. Because actually, I relied on the paleoclimatic uh, article entirely. And, and then this, uh, this article was uh, destroyed by another one. So uh, as an historian, I was left <laughs> in the middle of nowhere, having writing uh, false things. Uh, because I, I I was relying, so I will I will wait for the paleoclimatologists to settle their uh, uh, their differences, to settle their their, 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 their debates uh, before now uh, going back to to, to this. But uh, I'm actually I'm exaggerating because in some cases, in some cases, it is very clear. Uh, it is especially uh, very clear in the uh, uh, Zhuzhan to Turks transition, because uh, we know, and we know for sure, because it's attested all over the world, uh, in Icelandic, uh, uh, in Iceland, in in Europe, in Byzantine texts, in Chinese texts, in 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 uh, in in. Um, Paleo, uh, paleo climatic data in, in, in Mongolia, in, in Tianshan, uh, everywhere, that there was a very uh, cold decade in the, uh, uh, just before the crumbling of the Zhuzhan uh, Empire. Uh, and uh, we know why, because uh, uh, there was a big volcano somewhere, somewhere on the earth uh, creating a dust veil uh, in the atmosphere. Uh, so, for some very precise, especially the volcanic episode, we, I think we might try to use climate, uh, paleoclimatologist uh, data, if we have a, a consensus between the text and these data and the 
consensus among the paleoclimatologists. Uh, but uh, for, uh, for much more unclear period like the middle of the fourth century, I will now uh, <laughs> I will not I, I, I will not make use of of of, of this data. Uh, Barbara Fark, Okay, there's a whole debate. I, I, as I was explaining with, uh, to Chris uh, Beckwith, uh, uh, there's a whole debate uh, going on on the notion of tribe uh, in, the, uh, in, in, in the Altaic uh, world. Actually, the notion of tribe has been abandoned uh, in uh, almost everywhere. Uh, the old model of a kin shaped uh, uh, model, uh, uh, has been more or less abandoned. And uh, I think we are much better if, if we understand these uh, tribes as political entities, or maybe, maybe, or, but political, it's, it's look like a political parties and so on. So maybe the, the best way would be to, to, to understand them as uh, houses, noble houses. Uh, maybe you know the articles of Levi Strauss. Uh, on the Société à Maison, uh, where he tries to create a link between anthropology and, and uh, medieval society. And uh, I think it's a good, very good model uh, uh, to what was going on in, in the state. You have uh, aristocracy controlling numerous, uh, uh, numerous uh, 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 nomads uh, uh, and an aristocracy which is quite stable on the long durée. So, so uh, 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 and what is very interesting is that this aristocracy can be uh, nested. You can have a dominant group, let's say the, uh, the Sumnu, the family of the Shanyu, and when they conquered a different group, the aristocratic part of the aristocratic elite of this uh, conquered group were, was integrated into the nobility of a conquering group, or was destroyed. And you might find that 300 years after the conquest, the old nobility has still preserved the identity, the ori its original identity. A very good example of that is the migration of the, uh, 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 the, the, the migration of the Avars in the Western steppe in the sixth century. What, uh, what, what is the, the name, their name in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Byzantine sources? They are not known immediately as the Avars. They are known as the Warhon. That is a composite name based on two historical names, Avar, Huns. But we know that the Zhuzhan power uh, at the beginning uh, the Zhuzhan power in the fourth century and especially at the beginning of the fifth century was created by gathering the Wuhuan, the Avars, and also the powerful Xiongnu clans of Mong Mongolia. So that one century and a half later, when the imperial structure crumbled in front of the Turks, the groups going to the West, the, 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 their own identity resurfaced. They, re, they, they became again the Havars and the Huns, not the Zhuzhan. You don't have Zhuzhan in Western sources. So I think that uh, these, these tribes uh, are bet, better known, uh, better described as aristocratic houses with their followings and with their servants and with their nomads serving uh, uh, the aristocratic group. Other questions? Then let me ask you a question. In this discussion, and I know your discussion 
chronologically is a lot later than my question. Uh, but we do have this standard of Western term, Kiona, uh, that is seen in two Yash, Yash 9 and Yash 19. Uh, canonization of those Yash should be around, let's say, the third century or so BCE. Where, how, where would you place uh, those terms uh, in, 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 this, in sort of the, the broader context of your analysis? Yeah, I've discussed, actually, the, 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 these names uh, uh, were, uh, were used by uh, Harold Bailey uh, to explain why, that actually the Huns were Iranian. Uh, uh, but I have discussed with Nicholas M. Williams on that, uh, and it told me that from a linguistic point of view, I'm not a linguist, so I don't want to, 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 to make mistakes, but he, uh, if I remember well, uh, it's very difficult to say, to comment on Bailey's idea because, because uh, 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 the Riona, uh, uh, it, it is very difficult to know what a word like the Avestan Riona would have uh, been transformed into in Sogdian, would have evolved because we don't have any other name uh, beginning by in Rio, I think, uh, in Sogdian. So we don't know. It's, a, it's an hypothesis of Bailey, but, but we, we, we cannot prove or disprove it, actually, uh, because we have no parallel uh, for that. Uh, what is clear is that the Sasanian made use of this very old Avestan term when they meet the Hun, they transform mm -hmm. their names. In the, you don't have the Hun in the uh, Sasanian text. Mm -hmm. You have the, uh, the, the Hun uh, with a Yod. Uh, uh, so uh, they transform the, the name of the Hun so that you adapt it to the, the Avestan, the, 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 the name they were known, uh, uh, the Avestan, the old Avestan name. But, if you think we are doing, we, in the West, we have done exactly the same thing. The name of the armies of Genghis Khan was Tatar. But in Western sources, medieval Western sources, they were not known as Tatar. They were known as Tartar. Because Tartar was the river of, the, uh, uh, of El, and they seem to be directly <laughs> Uh, outside of hell because they were terrifying warriors and so on. So uh, it's exactly the same with the Rion in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Sasanian, in the Western in Sasanian text. The Sasanian made use of, the old, of this old Avestan uh, name to adapt it, to adapt the name of the actual force, the actual uh, new uh, nomads arriving from the Northeast, that is the Rion. Thank you, very interesting, thank you. Any other questions? Well, in that case, Etienne, thank you so very much. A fascinating lecture. And for everyone, this lecture will be, I think within a few weeks, it'll be online on the uh, Central Eurasian Department website. We are most delighted you were able to spend this time with us virtually. And we hope you will be able to come spend some time with us in Bloomington in person. But thank you so very much. Great pleasure to have you. And thank you everyone for attending. Thanks a lot for inviting me. Thanks a lot for organizing uh, this for me. And I hope that you were interested. Thanks. It was a wonderful lecture. And finally, great thanks to April, who always yeah. makes sure these things go off very smoothly. <laughs>